the frontline worker pay working group will come Recording to order. Recording in progress. Will come to order. Uh, a quorum is present. Um, this is just a reminder for uh, members of the public and other members of the working group uh, that we are in a hybrid based setting. So some members of the working group are here in person. Some will uh, be appearing remotely. And as I said at the outset, members who are participating in, in person, please mute both your microphones and your speakers so that we don't have an echo. Uh, and when you are speaking at the working group in this room uh, or remotely, make sure that your camera is on and then use the microphone at the table here in order to have the audio pick up. Um, and members who are participating remotely, you will have to uh, raise your hand in order to be recognized using the raise hand function and make sure that you uh, keep your microphones muted except when you are uh, recognized to speak. So those are the basic logistics, um, uh, which it's, it's reminds us, I think, that it's been a while since we've met. In fact, we're about six weeks past the deadline imposed by legislation uh, of September 6th, which was Labor Day, in order to uh, reach a conclusion for this working group. At the time, I think uh, we all agreed that we should try to continue working to reach a negotiated uh, agreement so that we could all come to the table and recommend a special session to our respective caucuses uh, and to the governor. And uh, the legislation called for a majority report and a minority report. In the end, we couldn't, in the event, we couldn't come to an agreement. And I think we all thought that was not a useful activity to engage in uh, if we couldn't reach an agreement. So uh, th that is where matters stand today. Um, we have an agenda that includes hearing from uh, Commissioner Robertson on the administration of a program. And the reason why I think it is worth our doing is number one, uh, the commissioner and others in the administration have taken the time to explore options at a practical level of what it would take to get a program up and running and how long it would take to get money out the door. And because that also gives us a window into the future about the timeline that we are currently on because uh, we have to be rea realistic about the fact that continued disagreement on how to distribute this money and uh, keeping that discussion uh, to this room and not discussing other extraneous matters, um, but keeping or continuing to have a conversation about how to reach agreement on the $250 million fund uh, leads to the practical effect of bleeding into the next legislative session if we don't act quickly enough. And so. Uh, for purposes of our conversation today, I thought it would be useful to get a sense of a timeline from the administration about getting a program up and running and how long it would go, and then uh, lead into a conversation about where we are and where, whether we think there, there's a path forward. Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, because I, I didn't see the agenda until today. I didn't, um, I didn't know that this was on the agenda, but I thought back, I mean, when we started this this working group um, back in the beginning of August, I think it was like our second meeting that we had discussed with Commissioner Doty that, um, and I thought all the members agreed that this was going to be an application process, and we listened to Louisiana, and I, and I thought it was an agreement that we were going to do it that way. Is there an issue of, of doing it that way? Senator Housley, I think uh, in the, we also have something that we just put together, which is a side-by-side -side comparison based on what we've seen of the two sides' proposals so far, which we'll get into that. I think we agree on an application program. They've been working on what that would look like and what it would take to get that up and running and what the timeline could be. So it's really trying to put a little bit of, uh, you know, substance to our conceptual agreement that that's what she'll, and that's what she'll talk about. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was just wondering why I'd this is the first time we've heard of it. We haven't been, we haven't met for a month, and I didn't hear anything that that they were working on this, or all of a sudden this was sprung upon us today. So I'm just wondering why I didn't. I don't, Commissioner Robertson has my cell phone number. I didn't. This we didn't know that this was on the agenda today. Well, they. I don't think there will be anything revolutionary. It's just to get a sense of timeline. What all it right. would take. Thank you. Because we are running out of time. Thank you, Commissioner Robertson.
Good afternoon, members of the committee. Um, So, um, Representative Winkler asked me to um, prepare for this discussion. And um, just to address um, Senator Housley's concern, this is not new information. I do believe that I've shared with you in the past that uh, labor and industry has been looking at um, what an application uh, process would actually look like or what would a Minnesota specific application look like. Um, we were impressed and we've studied the Louisiana model um, just about every which way possible. Um, however, um, I don't believe that it is possible to actually spot on duplicate that effort um, for a host of reasons. But before I get started, I want to at least go on the record to indicate that before we can make substantive progress around what an application will look like, what um, the overall distribution process will look like, we have to, this work group, have to come to agreement on the legislative language. Part of our charge is not just to come to an agreement, but to also develop um, legislative language. We have to get legislative language that specifically identify who are the pool of workers that would be eligible. We have to make decisions on what are the specific criteria within even the industries that will be considered. So the bottom line is, until we have those specifics, we have done as much as we can to bring it to this point. Today, I will talk about some of the things that the um, administration um, agencies have explored. We've looked at the state of Louisiana. We've looked at the state of New York. We've looked at other similar, other processes that rely on a large number of applications. So from from the administration's perspective, we've identified critical junctures where, where time has to be considered. Um, in order for us to ultimately get payment out the door and into the hands of workers. So I'll try to be brief, but at points I will sort of go off script because I think it bears additional discussion. So as I said before, this work group must finalize legislative language. The legislature then has to pass that language and the um, language has to be signed by the governor. At that point, that would be, from my perspective, that would be the implementation point. Once we know the number of workers and the qualifying criteria, um, then we can actually finalize the application, and we can also insert that application process into some IT infrastructure that will um, interface with both DEED and the Department of Revenue. We recognize that during the application period, we would fully expect a very high volume of calls. Um, The state of Louisiana indicated that they received over 100,000 calls the first day that the applications were made available to the general public. So in order to prepare for that, we would propose creating a high volume call center where we could be assured that 
um, inquiries can be responded to very quickly to help individuals in the application process. We want to ensure that those individuals that are applying for this pay are indeed those individuals that qualify for the pay. We know that based on any operation, there will be applicants who may not qualify. We have to build in some type of appeal process. The call center will help us manage the high volume of calls that we will, I think we can all agree that this will generate. We think that having an application period of at least 30 to 45 days is critical to the success. This issue have gotten lots of attention um, over the past couple of months, but if we all must remember that the purpose of this work group and the purpose of this initiative is really to um, provide some type of supplement to the workers. So we have to keep the workers at the forefront and we believe that an application period that allows um, for the agencies to do the, um, the appropriate outreach um, would be appropriate for this situation. We will need time for verification and for the qualifications that are included in the application to be verified. We're, our plan is to build an IT infrastructure in the application process that minimizes the opportunity for uh, agencies to intervene in those applications. We want the application to be part of the sorting process to ensure that the applications that are accepted, those individuals meet the criteria as will be defined in the legislation. For those applicants whose applications are rejected, um, we envision that we will need, we will need some time to um, clearly communicate with those individuals why those applications are not accepted. If we are still in the application period, there may be opportunity for correction. Um, <clears throat> after we go through the application process and we've weeded out those that do not uh, qualify, then we would finalize a list of recipients and determine the amount of pay for the eligible workers. And then finally, there would be the distribution of the money to the eligible workers. That is the abbreviated uh, list of what it would look like from agreement to distribution. However, for each point that I made, um, I probably have at least a full page of notes or, or more because nothing is as simple as it sounds. Um, in our research, we have, um, in, our, in our conversations with um, Minute, uh, I've been informed that we can, the expectation is that we would leverage some of the knowledge and the technology that have been used in other recent deployments to help expedite the process. But because there is no, um, there, there's been no process that will, um, that exactly matches this, there will need to be time for building the specifics and building that interface to pull or share information with both DEED and the Department of Revenue. We've also determined that in order to get the money out to workers, um, considering the volume of workers that we're looking at, um, and as, as Commissioner Doty um, spoke 
um, much earlier in our regular scheduled meetings, utilizing a third party uh, distribution um, is really critical to this to the success of getting these getting the pay out to the workers as soon as possible. And we also believe that it will be most efficient to utilize a third party uh, distributor. We've also considered um, different options that will mix and match utilizing state resources and contracting out certain parts of these services. We think a call center um, would be most appropriate for handling the anticipated high volume, and we'd like to consider outsourcing that. We've looked at what would it look like to outsource the entire process from managing the application which the agencies would develop um, all the way through the full distribution. And there are different, different models and we are gathering um, cost estimates for each of these processes. We don't have um, uh, estimates for the call center at this time, but uh, this research is ongoing. We do have an estimate as to what U.S. Bank would uh, charge for um, the final distribution. And looking at previous uh, programs and so forth, it is my understanding that the cost to distribute like a single um, um, gift card uh, for the distribution of the pay is about $2.75, excuse me, $2.75 per card. Until we have the actual uh, legislative language, we are not able to prepare a uh, thorough fiscal note, and it all, we are also limited in exactly what kind of estimates can we secure because we don't know volume. We don't know what the specific criteria is. When we have the legislative language, we will be able to build out comprehensive models showing exactly what the cost estimates would be to fully develop this program in the most efficient manner that will allow us to get the pay into the hands of those frontline workers as quickly as possible. Commissioner, just one follow-up question. Based on the assumptions that you have in this description of activities, what would you say is a reasonable timeline from signature into law and to uh, checks being distributed? I would, um, Representative Winkler, I would say from uh, agreement to distribution would be not less than three months. And that's being as optimistic as possible. Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Robertson. Um, so I don't think we got that presentation before um, that it was going to take three months. How? When did we know that? I mean, we've been sitting for a month now. Um, I just feel like this is being slow walked by the governor to postpone this and now another three months. When we heard from Louisiana, they did it in two weeks with no cost. Um, so I'm, I'm, I mean, it sounds like it's a lot of work, but this is the first that we've heard that this was gonna be three months. Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator Housley. Um, I believe what we heard from the state of Louisiana was once the applications were cleared, the actual distribution took two weeks. But uh, I believe the state of Louisiana had an application period that was substantially longer than two weeks. So there's no way they could have gone from start to finish in two weeks if they had a two or three month 
application period. So we have to figure in the application period. We have to factor in those that might be um, sifted or sorted during that time. So when we're talking about full scale from agreement to hands in the um, uh, pay in the hands of workers, it will take uh, some amount of time. That there, there's just no way we can uh, figure out who, in fact, is eligible if we're basing it on an application and then quickly turn that around in two weeks. And I don't believe that is the process that the state of Louisiana went through. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, uh, I'm a bit puzzled by this, that we would have the meeting today and that now today is the day we're hearing it is three months to do this. Would have been helpful to have known that back in July or August, at least, um, to have had an opportunity to, um, to do that. So it's just quite disappointing. Um, I think for us right now, the urgency, I would say, is to get something to the legislature so that they can process it and we can um, move this forward. But it's still disappointing that, that um, this piece of information from Commissioner Rosalind Robertson is just coming to us today. It seems as though this might have been something that could have been passed on earlier, even without a meeting, a letter to us as the members of the Frontline Worker Pay Work Group uh, would also have been helpful so we specifically knew uh, the timeline and what the needs were. Because I think we were all considering that this would get done by this fall, without question that that was the intention. So um, hearing a three month now is uh, quite disappointing. But nevertheless, I think the bigger issue is gonna be um, getting this move forward to the legislature, and I think that'll be really the more expediting way to uh, get this accomplished, and we'll certainly have those ongoing conversations as we go forward, but it's just disappointing getting this information today. Oops. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll go right to you in a second, Commissioner, but Senator Kiffmeyer, I think it's very difficult for administrative agencies to provide a timeline without any guidance as to what the application process will be. And so since we have no agreement, it's hard to uh, estimate how long it's going to be. This is a effort to project based on assumptions of uh, what this working group uh, might conclude uh, to create a time period. And the point here is that it's, it's October 20th. We are past the time when this will be available in the fall. And that's the, the reason why I thought it was useful for us to ground ourselves in the actual timelines that we are on at this point in time. Uh, because uh, whether it's, you know, if we want to change the assumptions that we give the administration and can shorten it, but we still are going to be uh, many, many weeks before money is in the hands of workers. And time is relevant and much time has passed since our deadline. And so uh, I can just, and I'll go to Commissioner uh, Robertson in a second, but the point, your second point is, why we're here. We need to reach an agreement because if we wait much longer, we are into the regular session and we might as well just agree that this uh, effort has not succeeded. Well, Mr. Chair, if I might. Senator Kiffmeyer. So I hear from you that without a plan, it's hard for them to develop a timeline. On the other hand, we still have no timeline, but the commissioner has put forward a plan that would take three months. I'm a bit puzzled by that. Commissioner Robertson. Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, <clears throat> we all heard the Louisiana proposal, and it is obvious that <clears throat> the Minnesota uh, initiative is, I would think, in many ways more similar to Louisiana than a number of other states. Uh, 
that have issued some type of um, uh, pay to frontline workers. I'm referencing uh, uh, some information that was shared with us from the Louisiana Department of Revenue. <clears throat> and the state of Louisiana had an application window from July 15th, 2020 to October 31st, 2020. So when the deputy uh, commissioner um, reported out that it took them two weeks, it did not factor, it did not speak to the application period. So if their application period was two and a half months, we're talking about a 45 day application period. Two and a half months is up to 75 days or better. So I don't think that this is uh, as different as it is being received. If it is an application process, then there has to be time to provide outreach to impacted workers. There has to be time for those individuals to make application. There has to be time for those applications to be verified in a way that we can move them to the next stage. Three months from agreement to distribution, in my opinion, is more timely than what Louisiana was able to do. I understand your concern. We all want this money in the hands of workers, but we cannot even begin the process of clearly estimating the time or the cost without an agreement. Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gibbs. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Robertson. Um, I, I get that it, it probably is complicated, everything you have to put together to get the, the funds out. But one of the, the key things is you need to know who it goes to. And so you need to have an agreement here from this frontline working group, which, as you acknowledged, Representative Winkler, we're, we're at a stalemate. Um, we've, we've presented our proposal, and I've heard yours in the media and throughout what, what your plan is. Um, this frontline worker group was tasked with, if we couldn't come up with an agreement, we could uh, present not more than three drafts of legislation implementing po potential options. Um, so somebody was anticipating that we may get to a stalemate at some point. Um, so in the same spirit of bipartisanship that you and I have been working together and, and other members, um, staff, they have the following documents to offer to this group. Um, one is our proposal that we've been talking about, um, SC 8708-4. And then we've crafted uh, what I've gathered as, as your proposal. Um, and put it into language base where we believe you are. And these two documents reflect the members of, of what this group has discussed. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I move that uh, SC 8708 4 and SC 8760, which are being handed out right now, be presented to the legislature as possible options to be implemented the spending of the $250 million. And I request a roll call, Mr. Chair. I think it's time we bring this to the legislature. We have 201 uh, brilliant legislators uh, that can um, hash this out in the proper committees. And uh, we can have Commissioner, once Commissioner Robertson knows um, who this goes to, we can hear her presentations then. But we've kind of been stuck. And we have all of these uh, frontline workers that have been seeing us in the media, hearing what we have to say, that the two different sides. and. There's $250 million that, that needs to get out to these frontline workers as soon as possible. So I'm hoping that we can pass these two proposals out of committee today, get them to the legislature, um, have them work on it, and have Governor Walls um, call us to a special session. So uh, Senator Housley, it is my understanding that you wish to offer 
uh, legislative language as a report. And um, I, it's not clear to me which of these documents you would like to offer as your own. Mr. Chair, I am offering both um, what I've heard um, you and the members of your team um, in the media, what you would like the $375 to go to the larger pool. So that is in SC8760. And then the one that we have proposed is in SC8708-4. And I think, Sandy, you have the digital version. Bjorn sent it to you. Not yet? It, Bjorn did send it to you, he said. Yeah. Representative Frazier. You know, uh, Senator Housley, I appreciate, and staff that worked on this, I appreciate you bringing these uh, proposals. But I, I mean, you, you are saying that you are providing a proposal that you believe best captures what our proposal was. Is that correct? Senator Housley. Mr. Chair uh, and Representative Frazier, yes. Representative Frazier. And Senator Owsley, uh, you were presenting this proposal to us on the day of this meeting, uh, not giving us a chance to review this proposal to see if it accurately captures our proposal. Correct. Senator Ms. Housley. Mr. Chair and Representative Frazier, we, I, we gladly could go to a recess if you want to take a look at it, but it's gathering everything that, that we've said in committee and that has been said in the press. We put it all in the one proposal. But if you would like to go to recess to look at the proposal, or tweak it any which way you want. I just think, I just think we have to move. We've been stuck for a month here. It's time for us to move on, get this to the legislature, get it in front of them. 201 of us can hammer this thing out and let's get that money to the frontline workers. Representative Frazier. I'm not requesting recess at this point, but I, I would like to just, just, just for the record, uh, as a lawyer, I believe an accurate record is, is necessary and appropriate. So when folks go back to look at this, uh, we did present a proposal prior to Labor Day. Your proposal was presented during the media. Our proposal was presented during these committee hearings. We reiterated in more detail our proposal in the media. But I just want to make sure the record is clear about that. Workers have heard that. Workers stood with us when we did that. In fact, workers questioned your proposal when you provided it in, particular, in those particular details, and they responded with some of the uh, details from our proposal that, already, that had already been proposed prior to Labor Day. So I just want to make sure the record is clear on that. Uh, and, and again, it would have been helpful if you had you, you raised earlier about new information and maybe something was sprung on you during this presentation when Commissioner laid out the timelines of how long it may take to actually administer these resources. This is absolutely new information, and it would have been helpful to have it prior to that. And I do feel like it has been sprung upon us. I'm not going to draw any conclusions about why, but that's absolutely what we're seeing right here. Thank you. Senator Housley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Frazier. I'm more than happy if you want to substitute your proposal that you had before Labor Day for the one that we drafted up, absolutely fine. And I, the reason we brought this today is let's, let's move on. We've been stuck here for a month. Um, they actually had the language in subdivision five, um, paragraph B, we can submit up to three proposals. So if there's another proposal that anybody has, um, that's one of the options that, that we do have. So that's where we are. We've been stuck for a month. And, and like you said, these frontline workers are wondering what we're doing. And let's move on and get them their money. Senator Housley, I just uh, talk about kind of process in the committee or uh, in the working group in a second. But I just first want to say that if we submit multiple proposals out of this working group, it is the same as saying that the working group could not reach an agreement. So I read this as essentially a decision that we are not going to come to an agreement here. And uh, if other uh, legislative leaders or members of the legislature can reach an agreement with the administration, great. But this working group uh, will not have been able to achieve its purpose. Uh, Mr. Chair, I. Senator we, Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the legislation, we have that option to submit a proposal. So I would say we have done our work in submitting our proposal. Okay. 
So before we go to a discussion of specific You've made a motion, and I wonder if um, you would be open to a review of what we understand to be the differences between the two agreements before we go to a vote uh, on those uh, pieces of legislation or draft legislation that you just shared with us. Uh, we prepared a side-by-side, -side, which I think captures the differences, but because some of this has happened in committee orally, some of, the, some of this has happened in press conferences, some of this discussion has happened privately. I thought it would be useful if we had a summary side by side to show what we think the two proposals are. And if we don't accurately capture your position in this document, we can correct it. And we want to make sure that you understand ours so that we can go to a clear discussion in this committee about what the reports might be. So if you're open to moving to that discussion. So at least conceptually, we are guided in looking at these two reports that you've brought together and so that we all understand what we're, we might be voting on. Uh, Mr. Chair, ours is in writing. Uh, we have it right here. Um, so uh, we don't need to go over that. Um, and I don't think we need to go over side by sides because I think we have done that multiple times in this committee. Um, so I would rather not. This is online for people to see the side by side if they want to. Um, but I don't think we need to go through it point by point because I think that's why we're at the stalemate is because of this. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know that there have been uh, some conversations, limited conversations among uh, members of the working group, or I am, but I'm concluding that there have been conversations among members, some members of the working group uh, between our last meeting before Labor Day uh, and this meeting. Um, I know that I have, you know, reached out uh, and, and texted with um, Senator Housley. Um, I've had a uh, conversation uh, with Commissioner uh, Robertson. Uh, I have uh, had conversation with um, Representative Frazier um, and Representative Winkler. Uh, and there have been two press conferences. But where, where we haven't where we, where we haven't been, and in, I know this is not a legislative body, this is a working group, but to declare uh, that we're at a stalemate when we have yet to really have a discussion of the two proposals together um, feels like thrown in the towel before we actually worked our way through. I, I understand that there is a disagreement over uh, the who to be included. I came prepared to ask some more questions about that uh, because the proposal that I've heard uh, from uh, the Republicans is uh, rooted in who experienced the most risk and I sort of wanted to parse that apart a little bit. So I came prepared uh, to engage in that conversation in pursuit of a negotiated agreement that we could bring back to the legislature. Uh, so. I, I believe it is premature to say we're at stalemate. I believe we have two versions. Um, I don't know that these accurately re represent the two versions because we have not had a moment uh, other than these last five minutes to take a look at them. Um, so I don't know the, that these accurately represent the, the, uh, the ideas that are embodied within this group, uh, but they certainly don't represent an effort on our part uh, to work our way through um, the differences other than what we know has been said about the, t the two proposals. I watched the press conference. Um, uh, I was here when we met last and went through uh, our proposal. Um, there are some differences, but there are a lot of things that are like. Uh, and so I came to this meeting prepared to begin to have that discussion of how can we find our path forward together, believing uh, 
that we shared the same view that we started with at the start of this, which was for those frontline workers coming out of this working group, we would be in the strongest position presenting one proposal to the legislature. And while I appreciate that there are differences, until we have actually worked our way through those differences together, um, had an opportunity to question one another to see if we can get to a clearer understanding of what those differences are and is there a way for us to come closer together, to reach an agreement, which is the way we do our work in this body. Um, this, feels, this feels like uh, like we're saying we can't do that part. We're going to just forego the effort on behalf of uh, the frontline workers and and just move forward with two proposals and cast it to a legislative body. That feels, uh, that's not what I came prepared to do. I'm here prepared to work, to work our, through, our way through our differences, which is what I think Minnesotans expect us to do, at least theoretically in this body. Um, so I, I am, uh, I'm curious about the why we would skip the hard work that is in front of us um, and just move to the, we have two different worldviews on this, and, and we'll see if we can duke it out in the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't see it as, as throwing in the towel. We've had 11 meetings prior to today, and we are, we're, we are at a, a stalemate, and you're firmly in, in that camp, and we're firmly in this camp, and I think it's time, if we're, if we're really serious and if the governor is really serious about getting this $250 million out to those frontline workers as soon as possible, we can't keep dragging this on. So I think it's time that we just uh, pass our two proposals on to the legislature, have them do the work, and have the governor call a special session and let's get this money out to those folks as soon as we can. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Housley has moved that SC 8760 and SC 8708-4 both be uh, submitted to the legislature for consideration by the working group and has requested a roll call on that vote. The chair, uh, the clerk will take the roll. The chair votes no. Vice Chair Housley. Yes. Commissioner Doty. No. Representative Frazier. No. Commissioner Grove? No. Senator Kiffmeyer? Yes. Senator Murphy? No. Representative New Brindley? Commissioner Robertson? No. Two yeses. Seven. Sorry. There being two ayes and seven noes, uh, the motion does not prevail. So, uh, Senator uh, Housley, we are here to try to reach an agreement. Um, and if we cannot reach an agreement, I am very confident that the rest of the legislature, without the benefit of all of this background, will not be able to do so. They're looking to us to try to do that. And so that was the uh, reason why we created this side-by-side -side comparison, uh, to try to understand the differences and to see if there's a pathway forward for us. Um, I looked through this document, and I think that there are some questions about, uh, th there are a number of differences uh, between our two proposals, um, and there are a lot of commonalities. I think those are accurately represented here. Um, we have a difference of opinion in the first line about the minimum number of hours to qualify. We have a difference of opinion on the time period covered. Uh, whether you had to be in person or not as a qualifier, we agree there. Um, on how you count whether you were working with other people, the next line down, we have, there's some overlap in those concepts, they're not exactly the same. Uh, clearly there's a, a significant difference in the included sectors. Uh, we've discussed that at some length uh, and is at the heart of, I think, why this is challenging. Um, it's our understanding that uh, you had proposed no income limit in your uh, proposal, we hadn't discussed it. Uh, and so that is uh, an open question on whether there would be a difference there. Uh, you had prov uh, provided a unemployment exclusion. So if you received, you had to have received less than one month of unemployment insurance in order to qualify. I think that is uh, accurate. 
Uh, the second section on administration, we both want a worker application, the application window, uh, that 45 days is, I think, what Commissioner Robertson was describing. Uh, I'm not sure that we have a strong difference of opinion there, but we just haven't necessarily explored it fully. Uh, we have a number of uh, proposals related to worker outreach and applicant support, um, which you don't have a position on, so we may not have a disagreement there. Uh, on administrative costs, we both agree it should come outside the 250 million, and we may have a difference of opinion on whether the agency should have to pay for that or whether there should be an additional funding source for that. Um, the applicant estimate, I think that your uh, 1,200, I'm sorry, your um, proposal used the same base numbers. We, our total number of included sectors gets to 667,000 workers. Uh, I think you're basing on those same numbers and we could come up with a number for you on the applicant estimate, but it's around that. Uh, it's the same base of numbers anyway. Um, the difference in payment amount, again, 1,200 versus 375 reflects a difference in the universe. Um, and then I think we have similar uh, provisions related to payment exclusions. Um, so there's a lot that's similar. At the heart of what's different, are the number of included sectors and therefore uh, the number of included workers and how much each worker would receive out of the 250 million. Um, so uh, I think a lot of the things on this sheet that are different outside of that realm, we could probably agree on. Um, and as we look at two positions, essentially, there's a, there's a proposal to include a wide number of workers and have a lower dollar amount per worker. And there is a proposal to have fewer workers and a larger dollar amount per worker. That is essentially the difference of opinion that we have in this group. And I think that there are multiple ways that we could move forward on a compromise between those two positions. Uh, we've discussed some of them uh, you know, and in various formats. Um, uh, one option would be to increase the pool of money, um, to have more than $250 million on the table and include more workers and have a larger dollar amount. Another option is to have some sort of uh, tiering where one group of workers would get a certain dollar amount and another group of workers would get more. Uh, a third option would be in using additional criteria um, to narrow the group of workers from our universe uh, but expand from yours and come to a compromised dollar amount and a compromised number. Those are the three conceptual ways, in my mind, that we could come together on these differences. And so I guess the question I have for any member of the working group is, uh, are any of these three pathways worth exploring at this point in time? Uh, is there any reason that uh, we couldn't come up with a solution that uh, used one of those three options as a pathway for compromise. Senator Kiffmeyer. Well, Mr. Chair, I would say, uh, isn't this also the work of the full body of the legislature? So if we move these proposals out to the legislature, those conversations will happen there as well. And by the way, even if we came to some sort of agreement, it's the legislature who decides and the governor who signs. And so all these conversations are going to be had within the legislature. And I think getting this the quickest we can to the legislature to have those conversations is the best way forward. Senator Kiffmeyer, unfortunately, the legislature is not in session. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I said this legislature is not currently in session. So there's nobody to receive these reports. Senator Housley. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we can't increase the amount of money. That's off the table because we were tasked with $250 million. That's it. That's what we have. That's so then there are two. Now we're down to two. Right. And if you increase the pool from um, long-term caregivers, uh, those nurses, uh, police, hospice, uh, first responders, um, you increase the pool, you're taking money away from those folks 
that truly were on the front line, and we've discussed this before. There are essential workers that the governor uh, deemed essential. We are tasked with front line workers. There's a difference between essential and front line. There's a difference uh, between a, a clerk and a nurse who is holding a, a dying man while he's breathing COVID germs on her. Those people knowingly took a risk and still went to work every single day. So I applaud all of those essential workers that went to work every day, 667,000 that didn't have the option to work from home. But ask your neighbors, ask your friends, who was truly, truly frontline? And if you expand that pool, uh, you're taking money away from those who are still, still uh, double masking, PPE, now we're in the fourth wave of COVID. People, my friend just died two days ago in the hospital from COVID. Um, so who is truly frontline? Do we, do we water, water it down? Uh, this is supposed to be a thank you to those who are in the front, uh, on the front line since uh, March of 2020. Senator Housley, I just can't let that pass without noting all of the people that we heard from in this room and remotely who don't fit your definition and who underwent tremendous risk and sacrifice to allow all of us to survive this pandemic and to allow those workers that you are listing to be able to do their jobs. And those workers, those nurses and long-term care workers, many of them have said to us in this room, don't leave everybody else out. So I guess my question is, is there a compromise between the two? Is there a way to tier uh, or to provide different groupings? Is there a way to uh, put our numbers together somewhere between where you are and we are in order to get this done? Or is it uh, just a matter of only including those three categories of workers at all? Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there was tremendous sacrifice by many, many folks, and, and all of them that testified before us. Um, I applaud them and thank them again for, for leaving their house and facing the fear of, of and the risk of getting COVID. Um, but tremendous doesn't mean equal. Um, the, we knew, or those nurses and those long-term caregivers, they knew they were walking into it and still went, and are still going. Life has not gotten back to normal from, for them. And it's getting back to normal for a lot of people right now. Um, many that are out at the, the wild game last night, uh, but not the long-term caregivers or the nurses or the first responders. They're still, they're still in, the, in the thick of this. So uh, tremendous sacrifices doesn't mean equal sacrifices. So I, I'm speaking on behalf of, of uh, Senator Kiffmeyer and Representative New. That's, that's who we feel the, the frontline workers were. There's many, many essential, but I, I don't I don't know where we can move off that because they they faced a high risk of contracting COVID every single day. I saw well, Representative Frazier, I saw Senator Murphy first. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and this is an important discussion. Uh, I, I have think been thinking a lot about the the small pool. Uh, that uh, Senator Housley, Senator Kiffmeyer, and Representative New have uh, proposed, uh, and uh, listening to the argument over and over again, what first here and then in the press conference, and now here again, about the additional risk um, that that subset of frontline workers faced, um, and one of the questions that keeps coming to me in that is. Um, and, and I heard this example again that they were uh, they were encountering breathing in um, the virus uh, from someone in the hospital or the nursing home. Uh, and I wonder if that 
is your in your intention um, with your proposal if your intention really is to limit frontline worker pay to those people who had had actual contact uh, with someone who was infected um, because certainly there are nurses who worked in the hospital but did not work on a COVID unit, uh, did not encounter a person who was sick with COVID, um, who would uh, qualify under the proposal that we see here, but did not encounter the risk of uh, Mary Turner uh, in the COVID unit at North Memorial Hospital. Mary Turner, I will remind you, is still working and she you know, continues to say that all of the frontline workers, all of the essential workers deserve uh, this recognition. Uh, and if it is risk that is the measurement, um, which you know, I, I've heard you know, a lot of passionate commitment about that risk, uh, then I think we have to return to our understanding of infection control. Senator Kipmeyer and I are both nurses, so this would make more sense to us. Um, in the practice of uh, infection control, and uh, then we we can't uh, we can't segregate uh, and exclude frontline workers uh, because whether you are in a hospital or a meatpacking plant or a grocery store, you are encountering the virus, and we know that by the data. We know people got sick. We know people died. Um, so to segment and say some are worthy and some are not uh, isn't upheld by our understanding of infection control, it's not upheld up by the experience of the frontline workers, uh, and it doesn't recognize the experience of the people who were called in to go to work and they said they would. Uh, so I, I do really struggle uh, with trying to understand, other than to make this, the pool smaller, um, the criteria that you have set forth. I, um, uh, Senator Housley, I'm sorry that you lost a friend two days ago. Um, and I know that you know more than 700,000 Americans have lost their lives to COVID and the surges with us and people are still dying. Um, and while um, it doesn't feel like a crisis or an emergency anymore uh, for a lot of people, it is uh, uh, a life altering experience. And I would say that is true for me as well. Um, and I talked to somebody a few weeks ago who had a different experience with healthcare and this is not a COVID experience, but it, for me, is a story that continues to resonate when I think about the segmentation or the exclusion of some of the frontline workers in the proposal um, from, from uh, the Republicans. So this was a person who was in a car accident, uh, and he uh, is still recovering from that car accident, but he, and he's a, he's a union painter, uh, was severely injured, uh, was uh, found in his car, his heart had stopped uh, when uh, taken to the hospital, then on life support for a number of days uh, and has recovered, uh, in recovery, but he has recovered. And when the people who encountered the car accident uh, found him and recognized that his heart had stopped, they did CPR for Good Samaritans. They are not healthcare providers, they are for Minnesotans who gratefully had had some training and understood how to do CPR. And, and if you look at the statistics, the, the people in the field, not in a hospital, but the people in the field whose hearts stop and are resuscitated with CPR is a very small percentage of people. It's, he, is, he is by all definitions a miracle. They did CPR until the ambulance came, until the first responders arrived. Who saved that man's life? Who is declared a hero? And when I think about our two proposals, the proposal that segments and excludes a bunch of frontline workers would recognize the person in the uniform, the EMTs, who for a living do this work, but would exclude those, those good Samaritans who showed up first, who are not wearing a uniform, who are just going to work, just doing their thing. But all five of them, the four Good Samaritans and the EMT, together saved that person's life. And in fact, I think it was the four who encountered it first. They're the ones who saved his life. They're the ones who did CPR until the first responders arrived. It is impossible for me to think about where we're at right now and not recognize that we would not be where we're at right now 
had those people not gone to work in the meat processing plants. We would not be where we're at. Our ag economy would not be where it is at. We would not be where we're at if people didn't go into emergency child care so the nurses that we know could go to work. Like we can't, we can, we can segment them out and say for the, for our decision that we, we want to spend only so much money, we're going to count you out. But they're all frontline workers. Um, they all are. And they all faced that virus that was circulating and is continuing to circulate through our communities. Um, and, and I just, as a nurse, as a registered nurse, uh, can't square, can't, can't square the, the science nor the value of suggesting that there are some who deserve it more because they face more risk because it just isn't true. The risk was for all of them. Um, and so I, I, I want us to have this discussion here. I want us to, I don't want us to just say we're in a stalemate um, because I don't think that, I think that the, the, the politics is driving this, not the value of the people or their contributions. I mean, if we're going to talk about the value of the contributions and the risks that Minnesotans took, then 667,000 people are entitled and not the 200,000 that are in the, in the smaller proposal. And I'm happy to talk about how we come together on that, um, but it isn't right to say a subset of people face more risk. That's just not right. It's not true. Uh, go to you next, Senator Frazier, and then, uh, Representative Frazier, and then you, Senator Kiffmeyer, based on who I saw first. Uh, I just want to note that on the side-by-side, -side, there was a typographical error time period covered under the DFL and administrative member's proposal. It should be through June 30th, 2021, not 2020. That's just a, an aside. Uh, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Murphy, for sharing that story. I'm, I'm sure those, those EMT, EMS workers would say that the heroes were the Good Samaritans that provided CPR until they got there. Uh, to that point, Senator Alza, you ask if we ask our neighbors, what would they say about who are frontline workers? Well, I, I have been talking to my neighbors. They work in food service. They work in the grocery stores. Um, that's the community that I come from. Those are my neighbors. And they've been watching this, and they've been hoping that we would come to an agreement and get these resources out to them. Um, the holidays are coming up. And it would be very meaningful for them if this was this appreciation was shown upon them and they received those checks um, prior to January 1st. Um, we, when we met, the first day we met, we all talked about doing something that was meaningful for our frontline and essential workers. And we all agreed that we should do something meaningful. The proposals that we put out there, particularly our proposal that is more inclusive, it is meaningful. We laid out a, an example of how meaningful it was, three weeks a month of groceries. Um, child care payments. That is meaningful for these frontline workers that have continued to put their lives on line for us so that we continue to move forward as a state. And Senator Murphy was right. We are rebounding quicker than any other state because those folks decided that they would take that risk on. They would continue to show up day in and day out to make sure they could help take care of all Minnesotans. And we should not forget that. And we should honor that. We've seen some of the, when we talk about the risk, some of the highest uh, spread rates and exposures in deaths have not come in our hospitals, but they've come from the workers in some of those industries that your proposal wants to exclude. And, and we should just think about that. Those are the workers we're saying that you weren't worthy enough to get this, but you died at a higher rate. You had a higher exposure. That's a risk they took. That's when they decided to go into work day in and day out, knowing that that risk was there seeing their co-workers get exposed, seeing their co-workers quarantine, seeing their co-workers die, and they continue to show up today. And we must honor that. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Frazier. Um, this isn't meant to be yes. a, a stimulus check for all essential workers. Um, I didn't hear of one outbreak in a grocery store, and I've heard of some grocery stores giving their employees bonuses for staying uh, at work and coming to work every day and thank those companies for doing that. S nearly 70% of the deaths from COVID came in our long-term care facilities. 70%. I have been screaming from the mountaintops for 20 months now 
that those folks in our long-term care facilities had the greatest risk. And those are the folks, like I said, walked into work every single day. They were dropping like flies in the arms of these people that went to work, and they're still going to work. So you widen that pool, and you've just lessened, lessened the dollars that goes, go to those folks that have been dealing with death and COVID day in and day out knowingly uh, and still go to work. Senator Kiffmeyer. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just so agree with what Senator Housley just said. When you are um, looking at what the long-term care workers were and the 70% of deaths and all of that and the breakouts that they dealt with, that stands very high above in the risk category, very, very high. I mean, that is beyond even just risk. That's actual uh, painful things. But to tell the truth, all Minnesotans have gone through a year and a half of misery, a year and a half. So we want to talk about extraordinary. I think of the children. I think of the parents, even if they weren't deemed essential. My gosh. The stories again and again of all Minnesotans who stepped up, who did things, who helped their neighbors, got no compensation for it. They just did it. And I think of all Minnesotans uh, being put in that situation. But the work that I see here for us is on that level of like the long-term care, which are mentioned in the legislation actually enabling our work group. So what they did in the midst of outbreaks and deaths and, and the actual COVID virus, uh, the ICU nurses, the first responders who were often the ones who came to the home of COVID patient, and they had to be that first on the scene for them, or not, maybe a heart attack. But I think that when we have those kinds of discussions of what those folks went through, uh, that is exceptional. And I think that's the important thing for us to remember and to keep that in mind. And, and I appreciate what uh, Ms. Turner said, but to tell the truth, it's about all the other ICU nurses that are not represented by the union that are com conversing with us as well. And I think we have a, a very broad group of people that are included in this, from the Department of Corrections uh, to the court to um, others as well. This has gone through quite a bit of conversation, but I, I think, Mr. Chair, in all due respect, let's get this to the legislature. The quickest way to get those checks out is going to be go to the legislature. They saw that in our, um, in our language of our statute. They saw ahead of time that there might not be that consensus. And that's not about failure because it's already in the statute that we could send up to three proposals. So let's just do that, Mr. Chair. Let's just agree to do that and then continue this conversation through the legislative process. Representative Frazier. Just, just for quickly, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, thank you for addressing all the Minnesotans that have been, um, that have gone, that are continuing to go through this pandemic and that have lived through some of the worst waves that we've seen so far. But I, I do want to just go back to what Senator uh, Housley said about the long-term care workers. Again, I, I've said this a few times in this me, uh, committee meeting because uh, two of those, two of the larger ones are in my district, blocks from my home. So those workers are near and dear to me in the work that they've done. Um, I don't want to conflate the deaths of the residents, which, which was very horrible, which is I think about all the time. There, there are reports about that. And, uh, but I don't want to conflate that with when I talk about or I speak to the spread rates in the meatpacking factories or any other industry where the workers were the ones contracting the virus and losing their lives. I don't want to conflate that because I do think they're different. Um, the loss is the same, but it's a difference considering what we're talking about here and what our charge is with this work group. And I do want to say we, we are, we've just, uh, the majority, uh, our chairman here laid out an option to provide where we could group these workers and you would have the opportunity to, if you wanted to provide more resources to recognize the group that you want to recognize exclusively. We're providing an opportunity for that. And what I'm hearing is that you're rejecting the opportunity to discuss a way to come to an agreement that would allow you to recognize those workers possibly at a higher um, check amount than 
than the other workers. Because we're given that option here, and what I'm hearing is a rejection of that. And I hope that we're not going to leave here with a rejection of that opportunity to come to an agreement. Senator Housley. Uh, Mr. Chair, no, I didn't reject anything. I just think um, we should take the, the motion that I had and get this out to the legislature uh, and let the conversation happen there. Well, Senator uh, Housley, we don't need to uh, have a motion to have the rest of the legislature have an opinion. The legislature is not in session. Sending them language has no force or effect of any kind. Uh, I voted no because I viewed the motion essentially as a motion to quit trying in this working group. And I don't think we should quit trying. Uh, I can tell you that on behalf of the House DFL caucus, if we reach an agreement, my caucus will stick to it. We will pass that bill into law in a clean fashion with nothing else attached, and we will get the money out the door as fast as we can. I am empowered to do that. Uh, I don't know, and I can't speak for uh, everyone else around this table, I believe Commissioner Robertson speaks for the governor, and if we reach an agreement here, the governor will sign that bill into law. Uh, the question is, is this working group empowered by all four caucuses to reach an agreement? And if so, why don't we pursue this path of, I laid out three options, you rejected the 250 million, I think we could look at the criteria you've used and narrow the, the, the numbers further. We could do two uh, groups, as uh, Representative Frazier reiterated, uh, there are options for this working group to actually get this job done. But I will tell you that based on uh, conversations about uh, Commissioner Malcolm and the governor's additional interest in uh, COVID protections and other topics that will be introduced into this conversation, if our working group cannot reach agreement on this proposal here amongst us, it won't happen. That's just the fact of life. The legislature is not uh, ready to take up uh, language in committees that's not in session. The usual process for legislature, the legislature to make a decision doesn't exist until January. I think this working group should keep trying. I think we should keep talking about these two proposals. And that is why uh, we are here today. Uh, I think we could give ourselves a deadline. We could say if in uh, a week or two weeks time we can't reach agreement, then we should just send proposals out. But then we should each be allowed to draft our own. And if it, I don't know why we should quit today. Senator Housley. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, thank you. Uh, it's just that we have met 11 times already, and then this is our 12th time, and we open it up with it's going to be another three months before we're going to get checks out. It's we got to move. Like, let's, let's get something done. So if you want to set a deadline, of course, I would prefer to get this out to the legislature right now, but then let's set a deadline, and if we don't, Bring your, bring your proposal and we'll send ours. Because that is, that was what we were tasked with, is if we couldn't come to what, seven votes out of the nine, we could send three proposals out if we wanted to. But so, so Senator Housley, are you saying that we cannot reach the point where we all agree and that we should not try any further? The working group has the option to send out proposals if they want to, Mr. Chair. I'm not throwing in the towel. I'm just saying we've already met 11 times, and on the 12th time, it was this is going to take three more months. So Commissioner Robertson needs language now. We already know it's going to be three months from now from whatever language she gets. Senator Murphy, were you seeking recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members. Um, I, I, uh, we have met 11 times, and 11 times we have met and taken testimony uh, from a variety of Minnesotans uh, who shared their perspective. Uh, it informed my thinking about our proposal. We heard from the people uh, in Louisiana about their experience. Uh, we heard from the various commissioners about their thinking, about their ideas, about the implementation of this once we reach a conclusion. Um, I do want to object to the idea that this is the first time that we heard that it was going to take time uh, to uh, process these checks for Minnesotans to set up the system uh, within the administration um, once we reached a conclusion. It is, it is, it is, not, it is not the first time that we've heard it. Uh, we, we, we spent a fair amount of time on the experience of another state and understood 
um, that this was going to take time once we reached a conclusion. But I, I will agree with the chair that until we have reached a conclusion, um, the rest of the work that needs to happen um, isn't going to happen. And if we were to take the path of just sending two proposals out of here, um, I don't know what the next step would be. Um, but we wouldn't have given any uh, explanation to the administration. So, you know, if we agree that what we want is to send uh, this money out to the frontline workers, then the best way for us to do that is to reach a conclusion here. Um, because uh, like uh, the chair, uh, I have been in constant communication with uh, uh, Senator Lopez Franson uh, and with the members of our caucus. And uh, if we reach a conclusion, uh, they are gonna support that conclusion. They're gonna support that for the frontline workers. They're committed to that work. Uh, and have remained in touch with them uh, over the course of our meetings, about the content of those meetings, about the progress that they were making, about the, the testimony that we have taken and why that has been so instructive and informative and why it has shaped uh, the proposal that we, um, that we brought to this working group prior to Labor Day. Uh, and so I'm in a position where I can say we are ready to negotiate um, and that the best way for us to move uh, that money to the frontline workers is to reach a firm conclusion here um, and to do anything less is signal signaling uh, to the frontline workers that we are not serious about recognizing what they have done for us and that we are indeed throwing in the towel. Commissioner Robertson. Discussion to reach consensus. I understand uh, Senator's how Senator Housley's sense of urgency. However, I would like to remind the committee that absent consensus, if this if this discussion waits, if this discussion waits until the regular um, legislative session, the three months that I'm. I mentioned, first of all, that's extremely optimistic. I want to make that clear. Um, but the three months would start after consensus is reached. There isn't any more that the agencies can do in preparation without clearly understanding what are the parameters. So I can appreciate the sense of urgency but we are long past the opportunity to be able to get um, these funds into the hands of workers in, in this calendar year. And until we know exactly what we're dealing with, we are at, an, at, we're at a stop in terms of our preparation. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I mean, we can sit here as politicians and, and differ on policy uh, all day long, but I think we're losing the focus that, that these frontline workers are expecting us to get the money to them. Um, I, I know in the long-term care industry, they, before the pandemic, uh, they, they had no workers to fill the jobs. Now they've got 23,000 vacant positions in these, in these jobs, and they're hanging on by a thread. This, to get this money out to them would give them some hope that we really do recognize them. The, the longer we drag this out, um, they're just losing hope, and, and we need to do something that, that recognizes them. And I think uh, after 11 meetings and, and a deadline that we already missed, Putting another deadline out there, I, I feel, is just going to drag it out another week or two, and we won't come to because we differ on policy. We, I mean, we differ, and I don't know if we can come together. I think it's, I think it's still best to, and we didn't throw in the towel. The statute says that we can 
pass out two, one, two, three proposals to the legislature, and that's what we were tasked with as a working group. So passing them out, we've done our work, and let the legislature discuss this. Thank you, Senator Housley. We do differ on, were you seeking recognition, Senator Kitfire? I am Chair Winkler, oh, but I. No, go ahead. Okay. Well, I just have a question for the commissioner, actually, uh, speaking here for the governor. So, commissioner, if these two proposals, which, by the way, the statute anticipates that, there's no failure in passing on two proposals to the legislature. Nothing in the statute says we have to come to agreement. So my question, Commissioner, though, is if we get these on to the legislature where they can work on this, uh, would the governor be prepared to uh, sign legislation if we went that route, sent the two proposals to the legislature, he called us into special session, would the governor be prepared to sign uh, if we went through that process? Commissioner Robertson. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Kiffmeyer, I believe the governor is prepared to support a proposal that recognize the many workers that made contributions during this very difficult time. Members, we are at our uh, appointed hour of conclusion. Uh, Senator Housley, I agree that we have differences of opinion on policy. Uh, the nature of a legislative uh, work is to compromise. If we send out two proposals that are very different from each other, we aren't compromising. And compromise is necessary in order to get money to, into the hands of frontline workers. I am not going to um, uh, renew this motion or return to this motion of two different proposals moving out. Instead, I will set a date of one week from uh, today to have the working group reconvene. It will be a remote option if that's what members would like, so it should be convenient for everybody. And I ask that anybody who has a compromise between the two positions that have been so clearly articulated today, bring it to that meeting and we will find out if we have a basis for continued discussions or not. And with that, we are adjourned. Hmm. Recording stopped.